morning, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Dr. Sente Richards. I am the Assistant Dean for Education and Professional Preparation at Prescott College. And if you've been with us before, you have seen my face and you've seen Ron Hennings. Ron Hennings, again, is the uh, program coordinator for at leadership. Welcome. And it's been a grueling four weeks, but <laughs> here we are. And once again, you find yourself wondering how to be the best educator as a parent. So this is uh, session four, I believe, of the Education Emergency Kit for Parents. And we're happy to be here to provide uh, another round of expertise for you. Um, and to introduce what we have, I'm gonna turn it over to Ron. Well, I'm Ron Hennings, and I coordinate the uh, Educational Leadership Program here at Prescott College. And it's my honor today to introduce the remainder of our panel. First of all, we have Lloyd Sharp, Lloyd's been with Crescent College 16 years. She's taught for NAU, Northern Arizona University, and Pima College in Tucson. She's in approximately 40 years of experience in public education. She coordinates our secondary edu um, education program for the preparation of uh, middle school and high school teachers. And secondly, we have Dr. Lynn McMahon. Um, I'm 35 years plus, I'm sure, in education. Uh, she's a co-coordinator of our school counselor preparation program, associate faculty as well. And then we have uh, Deb Metlock, who's our director of environmental education program and a PhD candidate here at Prescott College. All very experienced uh, veterans, practitioners, very much concerned about you and your challenge as parents to be, be, be the educator at home. Excellent. And this week we're talking about reflection and reflective practices. And what's that about? I mean, what is it so, why is it so important? I mean, we talked about curriculum design, we talked about finding resources, we talked about assessments, we talked about using your kitchen to create lesson plans. And now we're on reflection. And why is that so important, to you, you think? I'm going to turn this section of our presentation over to our three experts in uh, counseling and uh, outdoor education and ed education as well. Uh, they, they have real strong good insights as to what parents can do uh, in, in the value of reflective thinking. Yeah, sounds like they're gonna turn it over to you, uh, Deb and Lloyd. Uh, so reflective practices, what's so important and what parents should know? Well, to start with, Reflection is, is part of the education cycle, and it's, it's kind of the place in the cycle of learning where we actually get to say, okay, what does this mean to me? How is this relevant to me? How does this feel to me in the world? You know, instead of just here's this, here's this, learn that, learn that, now it's time to go say, this is how it, this is how it matters to me. And I think that that's one of the most exciting parts of education really is the reflective piece because it's when we synthesize it, we make it real, we ground it in our, our experiences. And then that allows us to say, okay, what are my existing questions or how does this apply to my life? Or, or what do I do with this knowledge now? So it sounds like, you know, it's uh, something that happens after or should it happen before? So I'm sitting down with my kids and should I reflect before I create a lesson, it sounds like it would be valuable in both situations. I, I, I would comment agree. or Lloyd, yeah, Lloyd, go for it. Well, I would, I would agree with Deb completely uh, that it's, it's so much a part of the, of the learning cycle. In my mind, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, and those of us who've been in education a while, it sort of becomes compulsive. Uh, but mm -hmm. I would also say that it's, um, it's, important because it's it's an invitation to take time for yourself and to make meaning of what it is that you're learning and trying skills that you're trying to acquire and then asking yourself as deb said what does it mean to me as i go along and then building that understanding into what you do next oh interesting so so this is a part of lesson planning is it, uh, Deb? I, I think personally, it's part of lesson planning for myself. And I've definitely um, had many times with groups where we start out with reflection activities 
then move into other pieces and then come back to those and and sometimes that's a really fun way to do it because starting reflecting along the way and then and ending that way it allows a student to really see where where have they gone with it have they had a transformation or an aha moment or um yeah yeah, it's part of backward design, right? What, what, what do you want to know? What do you want to learn? So asking those questions at the front end while you're planning is really important so that when you get to the end of the lesson, those reflection questions really help support the learning experience, the experiential process. And then checking in kind of midway. How's this going? What are you thinking about right now? What are those kinds of uh, metacognitive questions that we, we ask ourselves? And metacognition really is thinking about thinking. And in order to do that, it, it really is just continuously asking those good questions throughout the process. It doesn't have to be a formal lesson as teachers do, but if you can always be open to inquiry and, and how the process is going and what you're learning along the way, it solidifies the learning. It, it anchors it, so to speak, so that when new learning comes about, then that, that learning that was happening before comes forward and says, oh yeah, when we were looking at this, these were the questions that we had. And even though we're learning something completely different, those same ideas are coming forward within that learning so that things aren't separate from each other and they're not disconnected from each other. Yeah. And I think that's the piece of reflection that really supports learning. Anyone else? I was just going to say that, you know, uh, in our last uh, conversation about assessment, we were uh, telling parents um, to really consider about, uh, really consider the roadblocks that uh, the student and you as the parent experienced in the context of the lesson so that you can think about what would it take or what way can I bring that lesson a different way or is the obstacle me? Am I the one that's causing all of this ruckus? Do I have expectations that might be a little bit uh, less than realistic? These kinds of questions are perfect uh, places where one can reflect and you can see the value of reflection um, because through that reflection, you can deliberately set up a situation where the next day um, you have um, a conversation with your student and you are given an opportunity to reset, hit the reset button or look at it a different way or use a different modality. The, all of these are ways that reflect, reflection can be very useful in the uh, midst of assessment. And what uh, Lynn and Lloyd and Deb just discussed uh, just recently uh, are really good examples of ways that they can happen in lesson planning um, and also uh, as a assessment tool or as a way that um, assessment can be uh, validated. How do you know what, so, whether or not the lesson has been achieved or been accomplished? All of those are ways, useful ways that, uh, in addition to some of the informal ways that uh, reflection is useful, a, a more formal way that a reflection is useful to monitor progress of your student. And, and to mark achievements for your students um, are all metacognitive aspects of reflection. Um, did anyone else have anything else to, to add? Uh, we have yeah. in the last couple of minutes. Dr. Dr. Richards, I would add that as you sit, as a parent sits down beside their child and they begin to work on the lesson that the teacher has provided, the parent can be thinking, what is the intention of the teacher? Do I, is it clear to me and to my child what the intention of this lesson is? And if it isn't, you can have that discussion. By talking through the intention, the why this lesson is being uh, provided to the child, by having the child experience your reflective thought, it teaches them the value of reflective thought. And you model that to them at that time. I'll just add one quick thing that I learned from um, 
one of my students this semester and, and another student a previous semester in the course that I'm teaching a, a portion of a lesson plan that they put together from um, from a National Science Foundation and it and it invites you to think about preconceptions and misconceptions that your students may have before you start a lesson. And I think that could be good for parents to do too, as you were saying, Dr. Richards, about sitting down with your child and looking at the lesson and to maybe ask yourself and ask your child, what do you think you know about this? And and to really listen to what they say, because they may have pre preconceptions and misconceptions that, without realizing it, can get in the way of the lesson. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, just so that you know, we'll be uh, uh, talking about some uh, developmentally appropriate ways uh, uh, that you can promote reflection uh, in a minute. As a matter of fact, we'll be uh, talking about one way, which is journaling. Um, that's a very good question. Might as well talk about it now. We have a question from uh, Facebook uh, asking, what are some examples of developmentally appropriate questions to ask children that can promote reflection? And we have one example of that, which is, um, which is journaling. So uh, what ways can journaling be effective, Lloyd? For the student or for the parent? Well, uh, why don't we start for, from the parent and then we can move into the student. Okay. I think it's, it's probably equally valuable for parents and students. Um, I, I started my reflection on this subject by asking myself, why journal? And I would say one of the major values of journaling is that it forces you to stop. It forces you to pause. And and I think that is highly important at times like this where in a way we're busier than we've ever been in different ways. And as parents, we rarely take the time for ourselves. We're the ones that go on the back burner uh, and our needs go on the back burner. It also gives you a, a chance to think about what and how you think, which is metacognition, as Lynn was mentioning. And it's something Ron's going to talk more about in a minute. Uh, journaling is also an outlet for expression, which is really important, and it's productive expression as opposed to, uh, well, maybe not as opposed to, but it's more guided than uh, reflection that might come out of, or expression that might come out of frustration. Um, and it also, to me, the most valuable part is that it invites um, processing. There we all are, we have things that are going through our minds and we have to make sense of what's going through our minds. And sometimes that takes time. And journaling for me is the most valuable tool I have for processing whatever it is I'm trying to make sense of. Um, and the last little bullet point I had was the purposes of journaling and there can be so many of them. You can journal to record what's going on in your life. You can journal to vent. You can journal to figure things out. You can journal to sort out a problem or examine a subject or any other of a multitude of things. I have two uh, resources that we'll add to the end of the, of the webinar. One is uh, a book that many of you I'm sure have heard of called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And what she recommends for, this would be for adults, but maybe for older kids too. Um, in the morning, before the day starts, for me it needs to be in the morning when nobody else is up. You spend two to three pages just writing. You just write. And it doesn't have to be in any particular form. And what she has found out and what I have found out and other people probably know too, is you don't know what's in there until you start to put it down on paper and then you go, oh my goodness, I didn't know I thought that. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is something a student said to me when I was teaching writing and I was talking about brainstorming and the different ways that you can brainstorm for a written product and one of which is free writing. And a student came to me and she said, oh, I just love this. 
because she said, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? <laughs> excellent. And so as we see, um, uh, that was an excellent question from the uh, Facebook uh, uh, qu uh, question bank. And as we can see, um, journaling is one of those metacognitive exercises that you, that's both helpful with uh, parental and with student uh, uh, understanding of your emotions about a particular topic or just getting through the day and reflecting on the day or understanding what your learning outcomes were and did you meet them, what you think about them and what they can be done, what things can be done to uh, make them better and improve them. So um, we're learning that this is a very, very valuable exercise reflection and critical to making sure that you are the uh, one of the the best teacher that you can be. So uh, in this circumstance. So I wanted to just bring up, well, what ways can we also be reflective? What are some of the uh, catalysts that we have at our disposal that can bring about reflection? Um, and while we won't run into many people when we're outside, we still can go outdoors and experience the wonderfulness of nature and all it has to offer and all of the things it has to teach us and can be used as a supplement for our lesson plans. Is that right, Deb? Absolutely. And I want to start by sharing a story of a way that I learn. If I spend 20 minutes on the computer, really focused on something, trying to understand what I'm reading, answering multiple choice questions, whatever it is that I'm doing. If I do that and then I go outside, even for five minutes, it's amazing to me where I let my brain shift the focus. I start focusing on the birds, maybe the clouds moving overhead, the breeze in the trees. It's, it's almost like it's like guaranteed that I'm going to have a different and, and more comprehensive understanding of what I was trying to focus on. So that's just a personal piece and everybody has their own way of, of connecting. But some of the reasons that I think that nature connection is, is something worth talking about in this reflection piece, especially as, as we're doing so much schooling at home right now, that as, you know, as Lloyd was saying about journaling, journaling being a forced stop, going outside can also be a forced calming down, a forced changing of the rhythm. You know, in most cases, unless it's like a you know, a, a torrential storm, you know, a tropical storm or hurricane, in most cases, it's going to take us from here down to here. Our breathing can slow, our, our heart rate can slow. We can just let our brain or synapses fire a little differently. We can just let ourselves be distracted by things, but yet that distraction in the natural world is, is it deep reflection time. So it can calm us down, it can slow us down, it can awaken our natural curiosities, it can awaken our love of learning. It has potential to weave through not only our time outdoors, but all the things we are doing possibly inside at our computers or with our books. You know, if we see a, a robin bouncing around collecting pieces of nesting material, we might want to say, wow, why? And where? And how? I mean, that question, how is that bird building a nest with nothing but a beak? You know, talk about an amazing moment of, of learning to say, well, I've got fingers and thumbs and I couldn't build a nest like that. I mean, I really couldn't. So these things kind of awaken that natural curiosity, which I think weaves through all of our learning in school, out of school, everywhere. It allows us the, the time to use a different learning style, too. So, for example, if you've got a student at home who's doing something that is very specifically reading and comprehension based, as an example, going outside and exploring and playing around is just as much reflective as sitting and journaling. So depending on that student, what they might need to do outdoors could be very different. So the important piece there is that there's different learning styles and different ways that our students are gonna integrate. So if you've got a kid who needs to run around outside and scream and flap, flap his wings like a bird, to, that can be reflection and that can be just as valuable um, depending. And it's also can allow us to see ourselves as a part of something larger, a part of this world around us. We can see the life, we can relate to the squirrel that's drinking the water out of the flower pot, and we go, oh, well, I'm thirsty too. You know, all of these things are, are deep reflection times, but they're also times to shift our gears and allow us to just take that breath and be part of the world 
other piece I'll say, and we're going to go into um, specific activities later in the webinar, the other piece I'll say that I've heard from myself and, and students that I work with is right now getting outside in some cases isn't feels very normal. So I live in Colorado and going outside and hearing the familiar sounds of spring and seeing the flowers that normally bud in the spring, all of these things have been really comforting to me in this time of stress and chaos. And this also helps with learning. If we are in a calmer state where we're feeling a sense of connection to what we, we know is familiar, if we come back in to do some assignment that might push our edges a little bit, that, that can be very useful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Deb, I'd like to add two little things that came to mind as I was listening to you. One is, I remember reading how important it is for your vision to move from the distance that it is from your eyes to the screen to the outdoors where your vision, line of vision is longer. It relaxes your eyes and it's actually really good for your eyes from what I understand. The other part is the vitamin D that you get from the outdoors, which helps your immune system. And I think that's crucial right now. Yeah, those are great points. Yeah, and I know I can definitely feel the shift in my eyes if I've been focusing and then it's like a relaxation of everything and even my brain can feel relaxed. So that's a great point. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Lloyd. Yes, thank you, Lloyd, for bringing that up. Um, you know, especially like vitamin D is crucial for your immune system. And if we don't get out, then how are you going to get that crucial essential vitamin? So um, get out there with your kids and it reflect with them in nature. <laughs> so, um, but there's speaking of, you know, the vitamin D, we've been talking about ways that um, uh, journaling and ways that uh, nature can be uh, used as tools um, because we have done a lot of research on those. Um, there's been a, also a lot of new research coming out uh well not necessarily new entirely new but you know uh, definitely on the forefront of education research um that says that there's a um we really need to pay attention to the brain development of your students and what stage they happen to be in while you're trying to educate them on a particular topic is that right lynn yes uh <laughs> sorry about that well, I, I have this little tiny lecture about brain health, if that's okay to, sure. to share with everyone. Share away. Uh, uh, at, at age 65, the brain and, and the health of my brain is, is very important. Uh, and, and I think that it's equally important to our aging parents or our, our growing children. Uh, I have a brand new grandbaby who's about um, two months old now, and I, I watch his development via virtually uh, and watch his, his curiosity, his language, all of those pieces starting to come forward. And I think how amazing this, this part of our body is, this brain. And so I wanted to just share a little bitty lecture about brain and uh, brain functioning and health. Uh, something that I've been fascinated with, um, actually always probably, but much more specifically since I started teaching at the university level over a decade ago. Um, at that particular time, neuroscientists, the people that know the brain um, and educators were, were just beginning to have conversations with each other. And uh, so I actually t did a lot of, of research and work around that for learning uh, the learning perspective that really has stayed with me and has grown with me as I've aged and uh, been working on my own brain health. Um, one of the great uh, things that have been happening is that the brain scans have been more sophisticated than they were a couple of decades ago. And so there's much more research about learning with brain scans happening at the same time. So to, to you know, when, when uh, Lloyd and, and Ron and I were, were little, and so we're all in the same age group, you know, it was very particular about what the brain was all about. You had your, your right brain and you had your left brain and one was more dominant than the other and people were more uh, 
prone to be right-brained or they were more prone to be left-brained. And what we found with all of these scans is that's not true, that our whole brain is active all the time and that we can, we can be 90-something years old and still have an active, healthy brain. And you know, for those of us who are getting older, that's really, really good news. Um, and it's really good news for parents because you have children that are developing their brains while you yourself are developing your own brain. So there are a couple of little things that I, I wanted to share with you. Um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, I think that's pronounced uh, correctly, wrote an article that I read recently called The Quest for Bre Better Brain Health. And it helped me better understand my own learning and then understanding the, the health of the brain. These are some brain myths that we have grown up with that are myths. Um, for example, there was the myth that we really only use 10% of our brain. Well, that's not true. Medical scans show that much of the brain is active even during simple tasks. So washing the dishes or you know, uh, vacuuming or, uh, you know, picking vegetables, those kinds of things. Your brain is very active during that time. So going back to what Deb was talking about in being in nature, maybe you're walking mindfully through uh, a forest, but the stimulus that's happening by walking through the forest is activating your entire brain. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some portions of the brain that are more active during certain tasks than others. But here's another myth. Male and female brains differ in ways that dictate learning abilities and intelligence. Well, there are some differences, but not necessarily based on learning abilities and intelligence. It's really about the unique individual that each of us are. So for example, my brain is wired a certain way to get a lot of projects done. I multitask all the time. But my partner likes to do one task at a time and be, uh, be cognizant or aware of getting that task done. That doesn't mean that I'm more intelligent than him or he's more intelligent than me. It means that we have a specific preferences how we work on multiple things, tasks, projects, etc. cetera. Um, with a healthy brain, we all have the capacity to learn, remember, and make sense of the world around us. And I think that's a really key piece for parents with their children. Um, the other myth is you're dominated by your right or left brain, like I was talking about early. Earlier, many people do express and rece receive language more in the left hemisphere of the brain and more emotional expression in the right hemisphere. But what is more important is that brain scans reveal that both hemispheres of the brain work together in complex processing, whole brain thinking. So here are a couple of brain facts for you. Your brain produces enough electricity to power a low wattage light bulb. Cool, I think that's very cool. Um, here's another uh, interesting fact. Brain information can travel faster than race cars that are traveling at 250 miles per hour. That's pretty cool. If I was a 10 year old, I would think that was like super interesting. Um, four things you can do every day for your brain health. Spend time with friends and family. So all of us who are online and having meetings online and connecting online and calling our, our parents and calling our friends, that's a social activity that is healthy for your brain. Now, would it be better to be in person? probably just because we can connect with uh, others more readily, but it doesn't mean that this time in our lives can't be a connecting time. Another thing you should do for your brain every day is you should read and write. So if you're a journaler, 
That would be a great thing to do every day, even if it's just a half a page, whatever it is. And that's good for kids and that's good for adults. Um, reading, you know, a good parent loves to read to their children, right? Not that bad parents don't love to read to their children. They just might not have time. Who knows? But the key is to read. And if you have multiple children in your household, have your children read to each other. Have your children read to you. Read. That's an important aspect to keep your brain healthy. Um, the other one is exercise. So getting outside into nature, walking, running, uh, doing yoga with a, a virtual video, whatever it is, activate your body because your body is being activated by your brain. So everything you do physically is helping your brain. Um, and practice a new skill, especially something that involves creating with your hands. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to share a lesson um, uh, that talks about building your own little brain with Play-Doh. And so that will be part of the activity that I'll, I'll share with you. Um, but the other piece to that is for, for those parents who maybe have math skills from fifth grade below, and they're teaching a seventh grader algebra, learning a new skill, learning a new uh, algebraic uh, formula to help your seventh grader is going to help your brain health. And if your student is teaching you about algebraic uh, equations, their brain health is also being uh, uh, helped because they're teaching you something that they are learning. And all of that is a, is a process that helps with uh, brain health. Dr. McMahon? Yes. We have a, my... we have a question. Um, sure. There's a question out there that uh, uh, says, uh, cool, what might, brain-based teaching look like at home. We have a lot of um, uh, people that have this phenomenon, they've been reading about this phenomenon called metacognition and, mm -hmm. and how that relates to uh, brain-based education. What kind of activities would uh, teachers be, um, well, new parents that are, I mean, new teachers that are now parents in the home is what I wanted to say. What kind of activities can they do? Well, definitely building a brain is an activity that you can do that's a brain-based learning. Uh, in my resources uh, page that I, I sent to uh, Christy that will be shared with you, I have several websites that you can access that give you specific activities, uh, including uh, a wonderful resource uh, by the name of Dr. Judy Willis, who is both a neuroscientist and a middle school teacher. And she actually wrote a book for parents with activities. So I gave a link to that uh, activity as well. But everything you do is brain-based, right? You can't live, you can't think, you can't walk, you can't talk without your brain. Your brain is essential to that. So be creative about that process and get your brain on and check out some of these websites. So here are a couple of tips that you need to know, and I know my time is running out. Um, De-stress. Stress is one of the most critical things to not help for brain health. So really distressing, getting outside, getting that fresh air and that vitamin D, and breathing. Oh my gosh, breathing. Uh, and, and hopefully there'll be enough time at the end of this session to help you with a, a, a mindfulness-based brain activity that can help you and your child. Um, grab their attention. Go outside. You know, when the, when the little lizards go across the, the, the ground, <laughs> talk about that. That's grabbing your attention. Um, color. Color is essential. Use different colored pencils. Um, novelty, what's interesting about the way the tulips are unfolding outside? Um, creating personal meaning. So when we think about journaling, we're giving it personal meaning. So then talk about what you're journaling with your children. Have your children talk to you about that. Doing uh, relational memories. How do we remember our first camping trip as a family? And what did we learn in that camping trip? Um, creating patterns. 
littles are super fascinated by puzzles and patterns and how things come together. All of that is uh, critical to brain learning. Uh, mental manipulation for long-term memory. You know those pneumatics where you, you know, uh, Peter Piper picked the, all those kinds of things are helpful for your brain to remember. And then one thing that's really important is practice, 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 practice makes permanent. So if you're not very good with your multiplication tables, practice, practice again, and practice again, and practice it in various different ways so that it really gets cemented. Yeah, and, and that's then, a, oh, what, one more, please. Oh, I was just going to say synapse, neurotransmitters, brain transports. Uh, these, these happen when you're stretching, when you're singing, when you're acting out vocabulary, vocabulary words, all of those kinds of things help create those synapses. And that's my little lecture that probably went over 10 minutes. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Dr. McMahon. That was very enlightening, um, particularly as it relates to what parents should be thinking about while students are experiencing the lessons that you designed for them. Um, and while you're chasing them around and designing lessons and reflecting on what happened and trying to fix it and cooking dinner, there still needs to be some time for you as parent. Congratulations. You have met the call and you are teaching your students and life is still going. And there's a lot of things that will uh, be at play and becoming your direction that might seem a little bit overwhelming in this time. So uh, what kind of tips can we give uh, parents uh, in terms of taking care of themselves? I just wanted to add a couple of things to what Lynn said about sure. um, brain-based things. And it also ties in with, with uh, just what you brought up, Sente. A couple of things are singing and dancing as far as brain-based activities. And what came to mind to me was um, some studies that I've read that even people with Parkinson's, especially people with Parkinson's disease, who may not be able to speak uh, well, or even people who may have a, a stammer, can sing. And singing is, it's so good for the brain, not to mention fun, doesn't have to even sound good to, to be good singing. And dancing the same way they've taken uh, people with Parkinson's and as they dance, their tremors disappear. So you can tell that there are connections between moving the body rhythmically to music, singing to music that are connecting with the brain. We see evidence <clears throat> in other ways. Yes, thank you. And um, do we have, what kind of uh, parental uh, care should we be uh, thinking about, should they be thinking about? Um, I always tell people that, you know, despite everything that's going on, give yourself a bubble bath. <laughs> Without a doubt. Make sure yeah. that you are taking time for yourself to reflect. So there's reflection time, which is work, all right? So that is, shouldn't be confused with relaxation time. I mean, while you can relax and reflect, just remember that you're, you're sacrificing true relaxation in the midst of reflection. So you want to, and I'm saying I'm um, advocating to separate those two times. Your relaxation, do nothing, think about nothing time, where you're listening to your favorite music, uh, your favorite radio station, talk show, or do absolutely nothing versus reflection time on the day's activities, ways to con uh, get your students uh, focused on metacognition or ways to assess or observe your students performing metacognition. Mm -hmm. um, that takes a little bit of internal reflection and planning. What type of learning do you have uh, in the midst of you? What kind of learning styles uh, are you, are your students? And um, how can you uh, use those warning signs? Uh, I'm sorry, um, warn, um, how can you use those uh, uh, things that you know about the students in the lessons um, so that uh, 
they can maximize their learning styles. And so uh, those things are all work. And in order to do that, you have to have some reflection time. And, but in terms of relaxation and parental care, uh, what other things are out there? What other activities are out there? Well, I would, I would like to add too, Sente, that um, <clears throat> when it comes to parental su support for yourself as a parent, I, I think one thing that kids really understand, even starting when they're very small, is when you say to a, a child, you, you tell them they need quiet time. And part of the reason we tell them they need quiet time is because we need quiet time. <laughs> and it's, it's a very important part of the day that often gets discarded, especially the busier that we are. And I think there are times when we have to um, not retreat, but return to, our, to the role of ourselves, not necessarily as parent, or child, but you say to yourself, I just need time to myself. And I think that's very supportive. It allows yourself to disengage from these roles, <clears throat> your parent role, your, your, now your teacher role as parent. <clears throat> and it also helps the kid to disengage from the expectations of having to be the student who's supposed to be learning or the child who's supposed to be behaving. They can just be a kid. Just be a kid and you just be a person. And I, as simple as it sounds, I think it's extremely supportive to just, as parents, just to be a person. Not necessarily a parent, not necessarily a teacher or an employee, just a person and do what you need to do, whatever it happens to be or not do, as you said, not to do anything. And kids need that too. We don't open up space for our children to just be, to just be. Yes, and that's very important. Um, we all as parents have our expectations for our children and just be aware that in this emergency situation that we find ourselves in with COVID that, and take care that you do not let those expectations override and drive everything that you do. Because just remember, those expectations are ideals. And then you have real life with your students. So it's important to uh, make uh, conversation and connection and relationship with your students in real time. And yes, we all have ideals, ideals and expectations for ourselves. You know, maybe you're considering yourself as a failure because you, have, you feel like you haven't succeeded at this whole teaching gig. But just remember, in the midst of it all, is these are ideals and that we aspire to. And it's always great to aspire to, but not at the detriment of who you are right now. So um, with that in mind, um, journaling is a good way that we can bring up, uh, build up our self-esteem and self-efficacy. And it uh, looks like Lloyd is going to uh, lead us through some how to journal and some activities. Lloyd? Yes, I came up with six little suggestions of ways that I think you can be successful or satisfied, not that there is necessarily a successful way to journal. Um, and the first one is, especially if, if you're journaling with, uh, either with yourself or with your student, to me, the first one is privacy. Um, I think you need to know that there's a secure place for you to be expressing yourself and your, your child or student to be doing the same, and a secure place for that to be stored. So that sharing is voluntary. And as much as, as any of us may be tempted, especially as parents, to read what a child has written, or a, you know, it's, it's not a good idea. So they have to, if, in order to express freely, there has to be privacy, and sharing is voluntary. The second, point I would say is that it needs to be fun. So if you're journaling with your student, instead of making it another assignment, you would say, let's journal in a, in a way that is creating a fun experience that you look forward to and, and I hope something you would do regularly. Um, the third thing is to make it personalized. So if you have a favorite pen or favorite markers, or your child has favorite coloring um, things that they use or paints, 
and you have favorite paper or a favorite position or a favorite chair, any of that, make sure you use all of those things. There's no right or wrong way to do this. It's an open-ended activity. There's no product. You don't have to create a certain amount of journaling material. It's just something that you do, but it should feel good to you. Um, the fourth thing is that it should be tangible. I really feel strongly about this, that it should involve no electronics, no screens. It should be something that you can feel and touch with your body. So you have paper that feels good under your hand. You have a writing instrument that feels good in your hand. Uh, so it's very tactile. The fifth thing is that it should be uninterrupted. It really, to get into writing or expressing of any kind, you can't have your phone going off. So I recommend airplane mode because then psychologically you know your messages are still coming in. You're not going to lose anything, but you won't hear anything. Um, a designated time and place and space and a beginning time and an ending time even though sometimes it's hard to bring yourself out of that trance almost in a way, it's probably better to end a session than to get lost in a session for too long. Um, and I would say also to honor and protect this time for yourself because it's very easy to have other things come in and take over that time that you designated. And the last one I would say is it needs to be relaxing. Um, if you can create a place that has pleasant surroundings, you might use music, you might have a candle, you might have an open window, natural light, a comfortable position. The setting is something that you, a place where you look forward to be. Uh, and also take your snacks, have your snacks and your drinks with you so you don't have to get up. You can just reach for something that's pleasant to munch on or to sip on. And I think a lot of people find that it becomes something that is almost a lifeline. It's a time that you look forward to. And as I said earlier, you don't even realize what's in there that you need to reflect about. And once you've taken something that you're wrestling with or something that you're uneasy about and you, and you start to express it in words, it then becomes something you can look at it and say, oh, now I understand. Now I understand why I've been filling the blank. Yes, and see, and very good um, examples of ways to uh, journal. And I think that sometimes people forget to hold that space of, of quiet time and introspection, you know, sacred. Uh, while you're in the midst of doing all the other things that you have to do, irris irrespective of whether or not you're out at the office or in school, those times are still, those times still need to be honored. And the more that we can do that, the better off we will uh, be in terms of uh, social and emotional health, which is one of the next topics that we will have next week, I believe. Um, so we want to close off with a couple of things. One is uh, we talked about, you know, ways that we can connect with nature as well. And so Deb would like to do some exercises um, or an activity uh, that helps exemplify that. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I want to say is it's important to know that each of our students may have a different way of connecting with nature that resonates. And so I want to provide a few different activities. I would say try them all. They're all very fun, all age groups. These are activities I've done with preschoolers up to um, elders from senior, senior living facilities and everyone in between. So um, but just knowing that you may, have, you may have a student that resonates more with, with something versus another, and that's completely OK. So one of the ways that we really connect with nature is through our senses. What we see, hear, feel, smell, even if we don't have all of our senses, we can focus on the ones that we do have. And this is a really, um, it's like an easy entryway into nature connection. So one of the activities we can do with our students is to sit outside and create a sound map, which is to find a place, sit down, close your eyes, your journal or a piece of paper to draw on, and you listen. And what do you think you're hearing in front of you? And you, you draw it or write it. 
the side behind you the other side. It doesn't have to be right. It's not about, oh, well, you thought it was a bird, but it was a bee. It doesn't even matter. It's what do you think you're hearing? It can be an airplane overhead. It's all okay. It's just letting ourselves open up to that, that world of, of our hearing. Another way to explore our senses is to take a silent, a silent walk or a silent hike. And as humans, we are very conversational. If we are together, we are going to be chattering about things and sharing our stories, which is great. If we stop that and we say, I am not going to talk five minutes, 20 minutes, depends on how, how old the, the group is you're with or your student, how, how much have they been sitting? Do they need to run around and scream? I mean, if that's what they need, don't try to do a silent hike, you know, <laughs> like let them get their energy down first. And we walk silently and we look around and say, what stories can I get from the landscape? Oh, look, that tree is blown over. Or, oh, wow, there's, a, there's some uh, debris over here from a rabbit that didn't quite have the best night last night and isn't here anymore. And, you know, what, what is it that we sense, hear, see, feel when we're walking silently? This can happen in a wilderness area. It can happen in the middle of a city. It doesn't matter. This is, the natural world is everywhere that we are. It does not need to be a pristine wild place. It can be a park right downtown. Another, another fun way to explore our senses is through color. And I, th I think it was Len who mentioned color and, and the brain health piece. You go paint chips from a hardware store or create some with markers or crayons and you just pick out a paint chip or a color block. And go for a little scavenger hunt with that color. Amazing to me here in Colorado, I can find purple in ponderosa tree bark. You know, it, the colors are out there if we really let ourselves look and see. And again, I have done this with preschoolers and I have done this with people in their 90s and everybody, I mean, honestly, it's just really fun. A great way to reflect, a great way to change that, that energy of, of learning and let our brain focus a different way. Same thing can happen with shapes. You've, if you've got little ones, you know, let them pick their favorite shape. Draw it on a note card and head outside and just look for all the places something even close to that shape might be. This is also fun with, with not just squares and circles and triangles, but take a crayon and make a squiggly odd shape that has no name and go look for it. Crawl around on the ground, get dirty. It's, it's very fun and it's a great way to connect. I don't want to um, miss out on saying that unstructured play is one of the most educational things we can do. If we are out there and talk about reflection, this is like reflection on steroids. I know it is for me. If I go outside with no plan but to sort of work in my yard, it's like I'll have ideas for articles, sections of research, classes I'm teaching, students I'm working with, all these things come when I'm out there with unstructured time. If you've got your kid out there and they are splashing in the mud and they are breaking sticks up and building some little fort out of sticks and all of a sudden there's all this stuff, just know in your heart that as an educator, as a parent, they are learning so much right then. And maybe that's a time where you can take some of that rela relaxation time and <laughs> sit back and put your feet up while your, your kid is getting dirty enough that you may have to hose them off before you go inside. <laughs> but no, have faith in that. That is, that is learning, and that is the way that I think our species has started to learn from the beginning of time, and it's an amazing nature connection. Another fun activity can be to pick a place in the world, whether it's a 12-inch square outside of your back patio or on your deck or at a neighborhood park, and visit that same little patch of, of earth daily, every other day, once a week. Take the journal with you. What has changed? How is that one little patch of the earth shifting and changing and ebbing and flowing? This is mind blowing. I mean, as an adult, I love doing this and I, kids, it's, it's always very fun. Again, it's reflection time. It allows for that synthesizing. It allows for all kinds of processing to go on. We never even really know everything that our students may be thinking about from four days ago, sitting on the computer or something. But it, again, it, it's allowing that deeper connection and that thinking into our places a little bit more deliberately. I'm gonna check a little time check here. Okay, another activity that um, I wanna elaborate on, which Lloyd um, talked about was journaling. 
so taking the ideas that you got from Lloyd today with the journaling and saying, okay, what about nature journaling? What, what does that look like? And that can be a very fun sort of flavor. It's an icing on the journaling cake if, if you're interested in blending that with outdoors. So simple things like saying, okay, today is whatever date, this is the weather, here are the animals that I'm hearing or seeing, here's how it feels to be outside, here's what I noticed in the cloud patterns today. It can take two minutes, it can take a whole day. I mean, really the thing about, about something like this is that it's whatever it needs to be for you and your student. Important to remember that you may have one student who likes to sit and be very quiet and do lots of intricate journaling and another student who needs to run around and, and scream and, and these are all you can't, it's hard to force somebody into one activity versus the other. But nature journaling is one of those things that can go, it can create a lovely book of your time and a place, your time together your time working through a pandemic and learning at home together. It can just create a beautiful memory of that with the flowers and the butterflies and whatever's happening in, in your landscape at the time. And I've got a couple links that will be um, posted as well um, that are more details about what to include in nature journaling activities and how to incorporate those into other um, subject areas and other learning areas because they really do fit nicely with science and math and language arts and social studies and English and Spanish and you can take all sorts of, of other topic areas and weave it into nature journaling. Oh, thank so you. that was a that was a little bit of a run, but I would just say just get outside and play and see what see what comes up for you and for your students. Excellent. And I think that those are fantastic tips that we can uh, use as parents in order to facilitate a reflection in the in the lesson planning as well as outside of the lesson in opportunities that present themselves for learning. One thing that I wanted to say about this is um, for parents that are really interested in this topic and want to see evidence of, of this um, and how can I observe metacognition occurring in my lesson or with my students in informal situations is to do the I don't know. It's called the I don't know um, situation or I don't know activity and it usually happens impromptu in an impromptu situation. It's not usually a planned thing but instead of um, being caught up in the, in the why this and the why that, you can flip the script by asking them a question and if they, the answer is I don't know. That's the time where you put in this activity where you say, well, why don't you go think about it? And I'll give you a certain amount of time to think about it. Or should we come back tomorrow when the lesson, when the English lesson that you don't know about today is, is back in play? Let the student decide or you uh, negotiate that. And when they come back, when the time for reflection is done and we come back for a debrief, you ask, oh, so what do you, so you thought about it and what are your thoughts about it? Whatever they say, besides I don't know again, is evidence of metacognition. You know, that I thought about it and this is what I think about it is an example of metacognition. And if they still don't know, however, you ask them, we're gonna give you some more time to think about it, but think about what's confusing about this. And this will give you an idea as to whether or not it's apathy or something else like apathy um, that's at play, or if there's something else a little bit more concerning that you need to pay attention to. It, a, a good uh, example of this is if they uh, can think metacognitively about one topic and yet not so much on another, that means that it's not a metacognition problem. It might be a, a question of interest uh, that might be the situation that you're dealing with. Whatever the case, these are um, all activities and all uh, ways that parents should be thinking about uh, utilizing the art of reflection and reflective practices with your students. Please, if you have any questions about any of the resources that we will post uh, this, uh, in this session or any session, you can go to, um, I should say, you should contact education at prescott.edu. That's education 
at P-R-E-S-C-O-T-T dot E-D-U, and we will get back to you. Uh, this has been recorded, so hopefully if you have any questions after this date, which is, I believe, the 23rd of April, um, you can definitely send us an email our way, and one of our experts uh, will, or panelists will be more than happy to get uh, to you or get an answer to you. Once again, on behalf of Prescott College and the Department of Education, we wish you the best of luck out there uh, in your endeavors to being uh, teachers with your students. Sayonara for now.